Welcome to the Backpack and Light Podcast. I'm Ryan Jordan. And I'm Andrew Marshall, and today's episode is a skills short, where we give you a few actionable tips to improve your life in the backcountry. Today's topic is art and journaling, two things that may seem like soft skills, but which, if you approach them correctly, can really bring you a tremendous amount of joy when you're backpacking. So, Ryan, when I pitched this episode to you yesterday... I didn't even have to ask if you had a system for journaling because you are a systems guy, um, and I knew you would have one. But uh, personally speaking, I always intend on journaling, but I never really get to it or I start, and then I, I just sort of like by day three into a trip, I've just stopped doing it. So help me out with this. What do you get out of journaling? Uh, why would you recommend it, and how can people get started or do it better? Those are great questions. I think I have to distinguish journaling from writing a little bit, or at least call mm -hmm. journaling a subset of the type of writing that I do. And so I, I always think about what's the end product here. Is it going to be a record of, of my trip or am I trying to create a product for consumption elsewhere? For example, a, a trip report or a gear review article uh, published at Backpack and Light. So I, I approach those two things very differently. When I'm journaling, I may do something as simple as take a small notebook, record my observations, and that's the end of it. And when I'm writing, somehow I have to get that, that information that I'm observing or feeling on a trip into a, a form of prose that's then you know, publishable or digestible by other people. And so when I first started um, publishing things online, you know, 20 some years ago, I would take notes in the field. I would write a trip report that would then be published at, you know, my personal website. And there was definitely a difference between those two things. So now I, I am really trying to dial in the process of writing based on kind of the in product I want to see. And so I, I ha actually have a few slides here. So for those of you who uh, subscribe as unlimited members, you'll be able to see these slides on the video version of the podcast. So again, the goal is how do I translate the experience I have in the backcountry to the final product? In this case, some sort of publishable document. And so the tools I most commonly use are my camera, which might be my phone. It might be a dedicated camera, a small notepad. Um, often I will refer to maps extensively, not only in my note taking in the field, because I want to correlate um, observations of places I've visited to locations on the map, but I'll, I'll refer to my maps when I write back at home as well. And so I'll, I'll often have a couple of maps laid out, paper maps, as well as uh, software maps like Gaia or something like that, so that I can, I can constantly stay fresh about you know, the, the places that I've been to on the trip, which helps jog memory, jog um, the lived experience that you have out there and things like that. I most commonly journal with a pencil and I take an old fashioned pencil sharpener with me, I find that there's a, there's an emotional tactile feel to using a pen, pencil. That's really rewarding. That said, um, I do have, uh, you know, some examples of the types of things I'm taking. So pencil, pencil sharpener, and I, I generally go with a notebook that is as small as possible. This particular one is a tiny moleskin notebook. Sometimes I'll bring a pen. I like a pencil better. But uh, a pen often, I, I tend to write a little bit neater with a pen. And so um, often I'll have both. And I like the pencil because um, I'll often sketch maps and things like that about where my campsites are or, or things like that on the trail. So, so, you like, so you like having the eraser. That's the point of the pencil is the eraser. I, I, I do. And I like the, the ability to shade. So with a pencil, mm -hmm. I can actually... I can actually write emphasis that I can't 
uh, detail as well with a pen. So I can, I can write bold or I can shade, mm. um, you know, highlights in my writing and things like that to draw emphasis that I might not remember later on. So I'll use these tools and the, in terms of the process of note taking, I use a system called bullet journaling and you, you can, you can dive into the rabbit hole of bullet journaling on the internet by searching that term. And it's a whole thing about how people record and journal throughout the day, uh, maintain to do lists and things like that. But I'm mainly using it as a technique to record events, which are the things that happen at particular times. So this is the, the recording of events are what I use to craft the chronological narrative of the story. And then I look at observations, things I am noticing about the environment around me. And then the final thing are my interpretations. And I find that I do write a lot of interpretations later on after the fact, after I get home, but but being able to record some of those spur of the moment, spontaneous feelings in your journal while you're out there has tremendous value. And then getting back home and reflecting on that and trying to figure out why did I feel that way at that time? I'm not feeling that way now. You know, trying to reconcile all that makes for interesting stories. And so that's my method of bullet journaling. And I wrote down um, an example from a note. Uh, a note page in my journal from this last trip in the Bighorns. And so my event here was that I'm noticing distant lightning at 3.15 p.m. That's I usually use a bullet character to note that. My observation was that the temperature is 45 degrees and dropping. So I use a little dash to note observations. And then I use asterisks to note my interpretations of those. You know, Are we going to make it over the pass? Uh, and starting to consider alternate campsite locations, things like that. And so by, by separating these and compartmentalizing these observations, I can go back and it's much easier to then kind of craft a story at the end. And so when I'm finally sitting down to write, when I get home, I have at my disposal, I have my, my photographic record, um, with the, the camera that I'm taking, I'll, usually upload all of my photos to Google photos or something similar, and then have those displayed on a separate screen. And I find that really valuable because photos often jog memories and, and, um, interpretations that I, I did not originally capture in the field. So I find that to be a valuable writing tool is just to create a photographic memory of a, a photographic record of my journey. I'll do research often, especially if I'm writing gear related articles, um, gear reviews and things like that. I will have the internet online, uh, a browser window open so that I can, uh, use, uh, real time research while I'm writing to help build in the rest of the narrative that I want to tell. And then eventually this is what evolves into a document. And, and so in terms of document creation, I will sit down and write a draft um, as fast as possible, as uninterrupted as possible. And then I'll go back in and kind of fill in the blanks and, uh, finish up based on, you know, looking at photos and, and doing internet research and things like that. So here's an example of a photo from my last trip. It's a trip in the Bighorns, And this photo for me, for the, for the normal person, it's not going to evoke much because they weren't there, but for me, it captures so much of what I was experiencing in this moment, which was fire smoke and this peaceful, calm sunrise. And, you know, that first sip of coffee in the morning, um, the fact that it was cool enough that I was wearing my down jacket, you know, all, all mm -hmm. these different things. And so having that moment captured on, uh, using photography allows me to create a narrative that's much richer and more powerful than had I just taken, you know, 60 seconds to write down what I was feeling in the back country at the time. Right. Sometimes I will craft trip reports or stories or trip narratives and use the photographs that I've taken as sort of the spine of the piece that I'm putting together. Like I'll drop the photos in first 
and then I'll build my mm-hmm. essay around the photos. Because like you said, the the photos tend to be kind of a a daily, you know, you've taken them yep. through the course of the day and they kind of help you piece the story together. I know we have one of our authors at Backpacking Light that uses a waterproof journal. Have you ever played around with that or had any need for that? I do. I've used Write in the Rain journals a lot, especially when I was doing most of my hiking in Washington State. Uh, but in the Rockies, not so much. I, I will take a Write in the Rain journal with me in the fall, winter, and early spring when it is wet. Uh, but I tend to like regular paper. It just feels better. Um, and I'll do most of my journaling uh, either in the tent or in dry conditions. One thing I like about using a notebook that's as small as possible is, is that I can slip it into my back pocket and there's no issue. It's always there. Whenever I want to jot down a note, I've always got it accessible. And I think that's number one. And that's, you know, that's the argument behind using your smartphone as your daily camera is that it's always with you. And if you leave it at home, you're not going to grab a record. I find the same thing with the journal. I used to write long narratives and prose in the backcountry on a, on a five by eight notebook, but this is not something that fit in my pocket. And I found myself not using it so much, but once I switched to a miniature journal, um, I write down way more and, and I really enjoy that. Yeah. And, and like you said, people can sort of investigate the, the bullet journaling concept, but what strikes me immediately about it is that it kind of removes a little bit of the, of the barrier of writing every day in the back country, because you don't have to like start with, I woke up this morning and I had breakfast and then I, you know, I twisted my ankle and then I went through the whole day. That can seem very overwhelming if you're cold and tired and you're trying to get a record of your day in. Absolutely. And, and that's where, when I don't feel like writing or even note taking, sometimes I will just take a photo with my phone and call it good. And it, and I've, I've learned to let go of the idea that every single photo has to be perfectly composed, perfectly lit and, um, something that's meaningful to a broader audience. It's most of all, it has to be valuable to me so that when I go to look at it later, I have something to write about. And so literally I, I took a picture on this trip. I, I did twist my ankle on a piece of talus. Uh, I was traveling along a, along a wet lake shore and slipped on some talus and, and tweaked my ankle and banged my shin up. And I took a picture of my bloody shin. So that's not for public consumption. I'm not going to put that in any trip report, but it's just a reminder to me that, um, it, you know, triggers that memory of what I was going through at that time that, that can have an invaluable impact on your writing as you go. The other thing I like to do is I, I have on my slide, this, this image of a little thermometer there. I often take instruments with me when I hike. So it might be a thermometer. It might be a, a wind meter or a humidity meter. If I'm testing gear, I might take, you know, load testing sensors. If I'm evaluating the wind performance of a tent, all these different instrumentation on this trip, it's wildfire season. And I took an AQI meter, uh, you know, an air quality meter. And so I was able to take a look at the, uh, things I was experiencing in the wilderness, which was sore throat, uh, difficulty breathing, going up steep hills at elevation and correlate some of that to the AQI. And a lot of that was for my own personal data collection and personal experience. But at the same time, it allowed me to connect to what we've been monitoring for the past three months, which is air quality due to Western wildfires and what that feels like at that air quality when you're out backpacking. And it was really insightful and I found it super interesting. So a lot of my photos were photos of my air quality meter, especially when the readings were high. And then I would correlate that to journal notes saying, wow, this is how I felt during this time. I woke up one time, it was about three in the morning and I had a really intense sore throat to the point where I thought I was getting sick. And I, I, it wasn't out of the realm of possibility because I was really pushing it the day, um, the night that I felt this way was right after a day where I had hung it all loose in the mountains and did this big traverse with tons of elevation. I thought I overdid it. And then I looked at my air quality meter 
and the reading was an AQI of 280. And I thought, okay, so here, here's what's going on here. Yeah, we had this shift in wind and it blew right in. And I was just like, wow, my eyes were watering and everything. So, you know, doing that with instrumentation, I'm a data guy, so that's fun for me. It's not fun for everybody, but it allows me to connect the experience to my observations. Very cool. Very cool. I just, one, one note on my process. Um, if I'm testing gear, I will take that level of detailed notes. If I'm, if I know I want to write about something and it's going to be more of a loose essay, I actually like to, to not have as many details because I kind of like the process of, of letting those, the experience percolate a little bit in my head before I sit down to write about it in a few weeks. Yeah. Yep. And your, your perspective after the experience ages can be in some cases much richer and Mm -hmm. more thoughtful and, and Mm -hmm. introspective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to talk just briefly about one of the things that, um, I've started doing in the back country in the last few years, which is, um, painting. And I think that, um, so to me, painting is my fishing. It's, it's the thing that will stop me, you know, maybe in the middle of a day at the perfect spot and I'll be okay with maybe not making the miles I was going to make because it's just, you know, it's just the right moment. It's the right pond. It's the right weather. It's the right something. Um, and I've been playing around over the last few years with kind of getting my ultralight painting kit, uh, sort of dialed in and I'm still fiddling with it, but I thought that I might uh, offer some advice in that, you know, category. Um, so my first recommendation would be to, to use watercolors if you're interested in uh, taking art into the back country, um, particularly painting. I mean, you can, you can take a pencil or a pen or um, a lot of people use colored pencils, but um, watercolors are, they come in these, tiny little tubes. It's hard to get more ultralight than that. Um, And they don't require any kind of chemicals or solvents or any of that to to use. It's, as they say, just water. Um, So not only is that good from a leave no trace perspective, but it's less things to have to carry with you. Um, Watercolors dry really quickly, as opposed to oil paints or even acrylics. You can be done with a watercolor painting and 10 or 15 minutes and it's dry in two minutes uh, and then you can pack up and get back on the trail. So that's, that's really nice. Um, the other thing I like about them is that uh, they also, like I said, they come in these tubes, but you can also get them in cakes, which is essentially just dehydrated paint, uh, which should appeal to anybody who likes to dehydrate, you know, apricots or something like that. Uh, yeah. These are the kind of paints that come in little trays, like for kids. Yeah, and and you can even use those, but they the next level up, and you can find these at like Michaels or on Amazon. They actually sell travel watercolor kits that are designed for, you know, adults, and it's a higher quality paint, and it's just in a little cube, and you can just drop some water on it and and use that. Um, and then the final thing that I like about watercolors is because the paint brushes are easy to clean and the paint is water soluble, you don't have to have multiple brushes with you. If you've ever seen an oil painter paint, they a lot of times have a lot of different brushes. Um, so from an ultralight standpoint, just having one kind of medium sized brush is, is really nice. As a side note, um, when I first started doing this, much like when I first started backpacking and I cut my toothbrush in half, uh, I was I cut my brush in half, and it was a lot harder to work with. Uh, so just like a toothbrush where you end up maybe with something that you're sticking your dirty fingers in your mouth and it ends up being counterproductive and just make your life harder, same thing with brushes. I would not recommend trying to cut them down. Like just, just eat the weight penalty of uh, – let's see, I'm going to measure this. Point zero one ounces of <laughs> for my paintbrush. So yeah. there's no reason to cut that in half. I have this same experience with a pencil. So, you know, I mean, you can use a golf pencil and save weight, but I find that once the pencil's so short that it 
it no longer rests at the crook between your index the finger and thumb then it's it's not worth it and it's right and it, then yeah. you start doing this kind of thing and it and yeah. the writing no longer becomes enjoyable i have started to playing around with just um cutting a little square fold of cardboard and sort of taping it around my brush so that it just doesn't get bent up in my pack mm -hmm. um and the other thing I've, that I've started doing is just bringing one tube of paint with me. So you end up painting mm -hmm. monochromatic, but um, it's kind of an interesting challenge. And again, you know, if you're if you're trying to take ultralight philosophy and apply it to this particular subset of of the hobby, uh, it's interesting to try to figure out, you know, how minimalist can you get and still be enjoying yourself. So, right. do you find that? you are you are creating finished products when you're out there using a minimalist approach to watercolor painting and then coming home and painting something more robust more finished or are those the end products i've done it both ways so i took a recent trip where i sketched a version of this salamander with mm -hmm. with paint and then i came home and i uh, rendered it larger and in more detail and in more colors um, on on this piece of paper. But I've also done things like um, just really loosely sketched like this heron here. Um, and I, you know, this is a pretty loose style. I considered it a finished product. I did it in the field. And, you know, I've, I've sold this piece because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's finished enough for people yeah. to be interested in. Um, and I, and I like of, the idea of, of, of doing it all out there. Right. Are you using a spiral notebook, uh, uh, individual sheets of paper? Do you have an easel? I mean, how, what's your, what's your medium yeah. process here? I've done both. So with watercolors, you, you, it needs to be a heavy textured paper so that it holds the paint and holds the water without buckling, um, and turning into a mess as you paint on it. Um, if you've ever watched like a four-year-old try to to use one of those kitty paint kits on like printer paper you know what yeah. a giant mess that turns into right. um so this is a notebook by this is a moleskine notebook uh, and it's specifically for watercolors and the nice thing about it is is that it lays completely flat uh mm -hmm. so that you don't you know you don't end up with a spiral in your way or something like that um I have also, though, I mean, this is this is fairly beefy. At um, let's get a weight here. Uh, that whole notebook is four ounces. If I didn't want to eat that penalty, and I knew I was only going to be out for a few days, I would only take you know two or three sheets of paper with me and just make sure they didn't get bent up somehow. Very cool. I was um, talking with my son Chase about creativity in the backcountry, and he's. He's a composer, music mm -hmm. composer. And so his process at home is to use this giant notebook. The thing must be 18 inches wide, a, a foot or 14 inches tall. And it's got multiple staff lines for each um, instrument line on it. And so he's got that. He's got a piano or a viola where he's banging out themes and testing what he's writing. He's got a computer with uh, uh, digital composition software on it. And so he's, he has a workstation that is bigger than my video workstation for mm -hmm. composing. And then I've watched him through the years um, transition into composing in nature. And he uses a tiny little moleskin notebook um, and a pencil, and that's it. And so I was asking him, are you, are you as efficient writing like that versus writing at your workstation back home? And he, he said something really interesting to me that what he's doing in the backcountry is developing themes that nature inspires him to, you know, dream up in his head. And then when he gets home, he takes those themes and turns them into finished products. And I found that really interesting because I watch him compose in the backcountry and he will sit there with that little tiny notebook for an hour or two hours and he'll be writing, erasing, writing, erasing. Mm -hmm. He's not writing mm -hmm. a whole, whole piece. He's working on a theme. And then he'll mm -hmm. take those five or six themes that he creates on a track and then turns it into a finished piece back home. It's fascinating to me. He's and sketching. So I've actually, he's sketching. And, yeah. and so that, that made me think about writing 
and then transitioning to a bullet journal approach, which is basically to create the themes that then I want to incorporate into my writing later mm -hmm. on. Yeah, I I really like that. So I showed the salamander earlier, and the the piece that I ended up writing for Backpacking Light ended up having a salamander theme, mm -hmm. which which was born out of and developed out of just a chance fact that I happened to to start sketching a salamander on that trip, and it it just sort of grew to embody the entire flavor of the experience in a way that um, changed how I think about that trip. And I wouldn't have had that experience if I hadn't been intentionally practicing some type of creativity in the backcountry. Definitely. And we should put a link to Salamander Song in the show notes mm -hmm. so people can kind of see what your finished product looks like. And I had a question about that article specifically. I know it was born out of painting, but did you do any writing or literary craft when you were in the backcountry back on that trip? No, no, that's I did not. Yeah. That was a fantastic I, reflective piece. So that's interesting to me. Yeah. It, it was born out of the photography and the painting. That was, mm -hmm. that was mostly what I concentrated on. And then the, those photos have such a distinctive feel that they influenced the way that I sat down and started to write. Yeah. So let's, let's transition a little bit into photography since photography was such an important part of that essay. You, you're using a, a fairly nice camera. It's a Sony RX 100 on that trip, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you envision the style in which you edited those photos for the finished product when you were on the trip or did, did that style evolve later afterwards? That's an interesting question. It was a little of both. And I do like to edit my photos a little bit on my phone when I'm out there. If I have the juice and, mm -hmm. I, and I'm in the right frame of mind, I don't necessarily like to be staring at my screen you know, the whole time I'm out there. But um, right. yeah, I like to shoot photos and then just start to just kind of rough in, like, like you said with Chase, just kind of like not to get too far into it, but just rough out some, some edits and see if I like the way they look. And then the next day... I was like, okay, this is going to be a, this is a green trip. This is green and blue. Yeah. These are, this is greens and blues and mist. And so then that informed my photography. Those are the subjects that I focused on for the rest of that trip. When I first saw those photos, the word that came to my mind was moody, alternate mm -hmm. moody. And mm -hmm. I think that's used because I'm so used to Rocky mountain sunshine. I don't get to experience like that. And it was a really unique and powerful experience for me to read your essay and see those photos. And so I was wondering if, if that was what you were experiencing and how much of that you crafted when you were back there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the short answer is it's a little of both and it depends on the trip yeah. that I'm on and, and what I'm doing, but I've never edited photos on a trip. I, I think I'm going to try that. See if I can kind of capture the essence at least of my, my yeah. overall mood before I get home. And, you know, we've talked about cameras and, and camera uh, technology on the podcast before, but just as an addendum to that, I'm now using an iPhone 12 Pro Max, which has three cameras on it and is a wide angle and a medium length lens and then a, a little bit of a long lens. And I I actually haven't taken my Sony into the backcountry in, in about a year now because this is now wow. such a powerful and versatile tool for me. And as a bonus, the photos are already right there, you know, ready to be right. uh, um, edited and I don't have to spend any time or battery life, you know, transferring from my Sony to the phone. Yeah. Every time I get a new phone, I, you know, the camera upgrades are so good that I end up using only my phone and leaving my camera behind. Now, I've never gone a year. But I, I do go several months thinking that the phone is enough. On this trip, I was finally missing my Sony RX100 again. Mm. So I, was, I was yearning to go back to a camera. So I'm, I'm wondering if I either need to go back to the camera or if I need your phone <laughs> based on your <laughs> so, experience. I've never, I've never survived a year. But was it, was it a particular thing you were trying to take a picture of that, that you went, oh, if I had my Sony, this photo would come out better? 
Yeah, it's color rendition when you're looking at soft hues of smoke. You know, the mm -hmm. iPhone just can't quite nail mm -hmm. that. At least my version. I think I have a version mm -hmm. 10, but mm -hmm. yeah. I was missing okay. that manual control. This... Right, 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 right. Awesome. Interesting. All right. Well, you'll have to. We'll have to update on this conversation in a few months because I'm actually leaving Definitely. on a on a trip soon, and I'm planning on just taking my camera, uh, my phone, and uh, it's a long trip. So we'll see if 12 days yeah. out is enough for me to miss my my good camera. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Well, thanks for chatting about this. Hopefully, people found it helpful, and um, we'd love to hear from you actually or see photos or see artwork if you are creating and doing creative things in the backcountry. Uh, let us know about it and maybe we'll uh, feature some on the podcast or talk about it a little bit. Drop us a note with your experience at podcast at backpackinglight.com. And I'll close by saying that I really encourage you to find some creative outlet in the backcountry. It's immensely rewarding, whether it's photography, writing, journaling, painting, singing, dancing, or composing. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Backpacking Light Podcast. The Backpacking Light Podcast is advertising free thanks to the membership fees paid by Backpacking Light members. A BackpackingLight.com membership gives you access to 20 years of archives, forums, and online courses. And don't forget, if you're an unlimited member, you'll get the video version of this podcast for free as a part of your membership. So please consider supporting this podcast and become a member right now at BackpackingLight.com slash membership. You can download the show notes for this episode at backpackinglight.com slash podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review. It does help other people find the show. Thanks for listening to the Backpacking Light podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And if we can leave you with one parting message, it's this. Pack less, be more, because lighter is better. Happy trails, everybody. So I shouldered my backpack, walk away from the car.